great crowd tonight. Thank you for coming. I'm going to start a little early with a bit of housekeeping before David comes up. Um, as usual, first of all, I'd like to remind you that I'm the chairman of this group. Uh, we have our two vice chairmen here tonight, Betty Conley over there. Betty, that's Betty Conley. Helen Wilson over there. You read her writing in the Squirrel Hill News. Uh, I think I saw Kathleen Young, our treasurer, she's here. A member of our executive committee, Ralph Love and Patty Hurt, our news, Patty Hughes, are here as well, somewhere wandering around. And uh, they, they are the leadership of this group. Squirrel Hill Historical Society, 11 years old. Uh, some of you are old members, and you know that. Others do. We're a volunteer membership organization. Obviously, these talks are free, but we'd like to have new members. Uh, and some of you in this room are not. And their membership forms over here. It's just $10 for an individual, $15 for uh, a, a pair of you. And we would like very much to have you join and, and be part of the family. Um, I have one announcement uh, that I was asked to make. Uh, on July 12th, there will be the annual Stephen Foster Days and Duda Days, uh, a remembrance of uh, women and children who died at the Arsenal explosion, and also the 200-year-old birthday of Lawrenceville. And well, it starts at 11 o'clock. Also, had a question. Did anyone know where they, who, if there was and where it was a Dairy Queen in this town? If you have a known address, let us know. We have an internet site which you should take a look at if you haven't. There's a lot of, on it. And one of the things that's on uh, that we got a question through that was does anyone know where the Dairy Queen was? It was on South Side, South Side, Carson Street. There was none. There was, you don't think there was one in Squirrel Hill? Oh, yes, there was. Oh, yes. On on Fort. Yeah, right. On the <coughs> like by the Rose Tea Cafe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which one? The, the, it was on Fort. Sort of where the Rose Tea Cafe is now. You got that? Got okay. it. Very good. Um, I wanted to, I'll, as usual, point out that, that we have a list of our upcoming speakers that you should take. Uh, we send out announcements if, if we have your email. By the way, if we don't have your email, you should write it over there at the table, even if you're not joining as a member, so we can get material to you. But we skip August. Don't come in August. We won't be here. Uh, in September, Al Tamler from Pittsburgh History and Landmarks has just written a book. the historic collections director. He's just written a book on 20th century architecture in Pittsburgh. It's a very good book. He's going to come talk about that. Uh, Chris Rawson, you know the name, is coming in, in October to talk about a book he worked on called um, on um, August Wilson, A Pittsburgh Life. In November, Melanie Gutowski is coming to talk about Squirrel Hill Mansion. Some of you were disappointed when that was canceled a few months ago because of illness. Joel Tarr, who's spoken with uh, to us, um, He's going to he talk to us about horses last time. This time he's going to talk about early gas exploration in the East End. And we already have, if you turn over that sheet when you get it, we already have four lectures, maybe another one coming up in, ready in, in 2015, including the executive director of Andy Warhol Museum to talk about the life of Andy Warhol. The history of Nine Mile Run will start us in January. I'll talk about the Presbyterians of Western Pennsylvania, and they were for many years the dominant uh, church here. That'll be in February. And in May, we're going to talk about the history of Braddock's Field, which is a fascinating story about George Washington and, and what the head of the Braddock Battlefield History Center calls the second most important uh, Native American victory in, in history. The Native Americans who were that year on the French side defeated an American force, and he calls it the most significant battle, except obviously uh, out in South Dakota, in terms of a Native American victory. One last thing before we move to David, something exciting that some of us are working on, and we want to begin sharing with you, and Ralph Lund 
really initiated this. We're in pretty serious talks with Carnegie Library, both in Oakland and here in this branch, with these goals. We, we have had for a long time, a few people have used them, and they weren't in very good shape, about 20 years of the Squirrel Hill News. And it's now been turned over to the library, which is going to microfiche it, and then it's going to provide CDs to us, which we'll then figure out how to get more readily available for people. We've also had photographs, uh, a number of photographs, not a huge collection, which they, the library in Oakland is, now has, and they're going to be reproducing that for us on CDs. And one of the things the, the board is going to discuss is how ambitious to get in beginning to put this stuff on the internet. In the meantime, we're talking about getting a board, a, a permanent board at the Hill Library here to have ex exhibitions that the this organization would plan and, uh, and show, obviously including our meetings, but also rotating exhibits. Any, I've had one volunteer already, Helen Wilson will be working hard on that. Anyone who wants to volunteer, this will get started in the next two or three months, who wants to volunteer to help planning these exhibits, we welcome your name. Uh, it should be a nice thing to do. And, and we own a certain number of square little books. We're trying to get the library to set up a, a shelf or two of, for Squirrel Hill history here, so it's an easy access. And then if we get that, we ask if anyone wants to do, donate any other books that they have uh, to, to supplement our collection. So nice new steps. We'll keep you posted as we go along. Our speaker tonight has been here before, and many of you, I notice, know him already, David Grinnell who now works at the Pittsburgh Libraries, uh, has worked, uh, I believe, at uh, Heinz History Center for a while. David, at our request, has shaped a speech on the department stores of Pittsburgh. We've had some requests for that for some time. Uh, David was here earlier in doing a marvelous speech with, with a friend on the Thaw family. David, come on up. Welcome. Can you hear me if I don't use the mic? Yeah. Yes. I have a pretty loud voice, so. Well, I'm so happy to be back with you folks uh, tonight. It's, it's nice to see such a great crowd on such a nice evening. I was surprised. I thought we'd have thunderstorms and nobody would be here. <laughs> um, thank you, Michael, for the introdu introduction. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, sort of what I do. I'm actually an archivist. So one of my primary jobs is to work with records, whether they be um, documents in paper format, whether they be photographs, whether they be oral histories or film. I work with documents every day. And specifically at the University of Pittsburgh's archives, the Archives Service Center, many of you may have known it many years ago as the Archives of Industrial Society. But here, one of the things that we do is we really focus on the history of this region, and particularly about sort of the political figures and industry, um, anybody, anything that contributes to making the industrial society, so social service organizations, all aspects of it. So that's one of the primary functions at the archives for me is to work with these records, create some order to them, because most of the time they come in a shambles. <laughs> Think about your own filing cabinets, OK? <laughs> um, and so we have to create some order to them, and we have to do some description of them, and we write things called binding aids. Well, one of the things that about 15 years ago was developed was a web-based sort of finding aid system. So it made it a lot easier now for people from around the world to see what collections we have and what documents we have. Now, they're not always item level. They're usually collection level, so a group of minutes or um, a group of photographs uh, on a particular dedication or something like that. Um, but it has exploded, really, with researchers coming from around the world to come use our materials. Now, of course, some of them don't come to Pittsburgh. Some of them can. So what happened? 
We also start digitizing a lot of them. And I hope that you guys are familiar with the Historic Pittsburgh website. Anybody use Historic Pittsburgh? Yes. Good. Well, Historic Pittsburgh is a really unique repository. That's a word I like to use, a repository, a group of collections of things um, that has both full text materials. So we digitized books on the history of Pittsburgh. We digitized photographs. We've digitized um, a number of, of, um, of uh, photographs and other collection materials on that site. You'll also find some transcripts of some census records for Pittsburgh. It's a really great site, and I encourage you, you're all history-oriented people, I encourage you to try to use that site and uh, explore it a little bit, because it's a real great gateway to learning a little bit more about Pittsburgh. Okay? So that's one of the primary things I do. Yes? Now, how do you reconsider and use the microphone so that every person in the room could possibly hear you? Because I have a hunch there might be some that may not be hearing you so well. Would that be I really We can hear fine. I really, really resist. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Thank you, though. Um, so with that idea, I wanted you to know a little bit more about what I do. And almost always, when I do uh, create a, uh, a presentation, it's really through the context of what materials have slipped through my hands as an archivist, and what do I know is available on places like Historic Pittsburgh. So that's important. So when Michael said, you know, we really would like to hear more about something about the department stores, and I said to Michael, well, I don't know a lot about those, but I bet I could figure it out. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure it out for you. You notice my how I titled my talk tonight. It's sort of In Search of Pittsburgh's Mr. Selfridge. Anybody get that reference? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Selfridge, good. Well, you know, I understand some folks don't watch PBS. So I need, I need to give you a little bit of, of a brief introduction about who Mr. Selfridge was. There's a guy by the name of Harry Gordon Selfridge, who was an American, not from Pittsburgh. He actually was from, born in Wisconsin, later, as a child, moved to my hometown of Jackson, Michigan. And when he lived in Jackson, uh, right uh, shortly after the Civil War, one of the things that he did was he got a job with the local dry goods merchant, a guy by the name of L.H. Fields. Well, L.H. Fields became our major department store in my town. Well, Mr. Fields and Mr. Selfridge, actually, young man Selfridge, actually had a very good relationship. And Mr. Fields said to, to Harry, he said, Harry, you've got so many ideas and innovations and ways in which you think that these retail businesses should be going. I think that our town's just way too small for you. Now, Granted, I wonder if, it, if uh, Mr. Fields was just trying to get him out of his hair. <laughs> I'm not sure. But he suggested that, that Harry Selfridge go to Chicago. And Mr. Fields, Lawrence Fields and Jackson said, I'll introduce you to my cousin, Marshall Fields. <laughs> that started a relationship. Mr. Selfridge actually began working with, at Marshall Fields and went up and became, finally became the manager of Marshall Fields sticking point for him in his relationship. He did very well there. Um, lots of interesting merchandising and retailing um, gimmicks, maybe. Um, and Marshall Fields let him do those kinds of things. But Mr. Selfridge really wanted to be a partner in the business. And what happened was uh, Mr. Field basically resisted. So what happened, Mr. Selfridge ended up doing well enough on it. Uh, with, with his finances, and would go away and do buying trips in Europe. Well, what Mr. Selfridge learned was how the retail market was doing in Europe. And he said, you know, it's so different. He decided, he put his aim on London. And he decided that once he had enough money, he was going to London. And he did, and in 1909, he opened one of the great stores in called Selfridges in London. Now, right now, on PBS, for those of you that don't know, there's actually a, a, a series, a, a program series, uh, on Mr. Selfridge. And the photograph on the left there is actually Jeremy Priven, 
uh, who portrays Mr. Selfridge in in the uh, in the PBS series right now. Now, Selfridge department store exists still today in London. It's on Oxford Street, London, and it's one of the few department stores that that is doing over a billion dollars worth of business annually. It's a high, high-end department store. So, I thought, because so many people watch PBS and know a little bit about this guy, Selfridge, and from this series, know a little bit about sort of his energy and his innovative ideas and stuff like that, why not try to think about some of the Pittsburgh department stores, and let's decide Who's our Mr. Selfridge? Okay? So, what I'm going to do for us tonight is I'm going to go through a, a short list of some of the department stores, some of the big ones, and some you probably haven't heard of before. Maybe you have. And I'm thinking about it through the context of who were these always men, of course, that created these department stores? Who were they? What was a little bit about their story? And what was unique about their store? What were some innovative things that they might have done there? So let's take a try at it. We're going to start with the big ones, the ones that I think everybody's going to know. But before we go to the actual stores, I have a question for us. We all use that word department store all the time. And I decided that, you now Mr. Selford started his store in London in 1909. I thought maybe we should start at the beginning of, of the 20th century. So I went to the city directories, and I went into the city directories and said, how many department stores are listed in 1900? Well, in 1900, there's only, what, seven that are listed, right? Yeah. We see Alton Reef and Sons, William Campbell, Gus Geese, Joseph Horn, Jones and Lachlan, in that fight. <laughs> uh, Jay Kaufman and Brothers, and Solomon and Rubin. That's the only department stores listed in that classification. Ten years later, 1910, it's, it's more than double. There's a number of them here. Some of these are probably some that you might recognize. I'm sorry that the print doesn't seem to be displayed very well. But, um, Box and Buell is on this list. Kaufman Brothers now. Um, Castle Solomon and Company. Rosenbaum's, Pittsburgh Mercantile, the new Boston store. Um, any of you from the East End might recognize the name A.J. Mansman, Mansman's Department Store. Well, as you can see, there's a change happening in sort of what does it mean to be a department store. So actually, that's my question to you. What do you think most of these retail establishments were before they were using that term <coughs> department store? Clothing store, a private store. In fact, there's there's a very large list in the directories under dry goods stores, and you see that one start shrinking when when you start seeing the department store become um, more of a term that they're using. What are some key departments that make some of the big department stores unique? Well, the clothing and the jewelry. Okay. Household goods, exactly. Also, restaurant. You know, that's for the first time you see these these uh, stores that have restaurants in them. Uh, they're probably selling not just men's clothes but women's clothes and everything in between. And kids, exactly. So, thank you for helping me define a department store. I think that that's what, what one of the things that's going on is this emerging idea that you had one place to go to do a lot of different types of shopping. You know, and that's a key word, shopping. One of the things that in the, Mr. In the Selfridge series that we find out about is that shopping was an American kind of idea. That prior to Selfridge's being established in, in London, what happened was if you wanted to go get a pair of new gloves, you walked into a London store that sold gloves, you went to a counter, you told the salesperson behind, I want a pair of kid gloves in white or black. They showed you a pair, you bought them. They didn't show you two pairs, they didn't show you three pairs, you bought what you were shown. You didn't buy it, you were asked to leave. 
<laughs> so the idea of shopping with, that was much more developed here in America was a key concept that Selfridge wanted to get across in London. And that's one of the things that made him successful there. So that's a key thing then with I think all of, all of these stores that are emerging as department stores. It's the ability to go in and actually see merchandise in front of you. It not being tucked away in drawers, not being tucked away. There's so there's all this new elements sort of merchandising going on, displays, um, outlandish things to maybe get you into the store. Okay. So our first store that probably almost everybody in this room who's been in Pittsburgh for even five years has heard about was the Joseph Horn Company, which. You all probably know that that building where that store was was down on Stanwick Street, Stanwick's at Penn. See on, on the left there, or on the right, is uh, a picture of Joseph Horn, the original Joseph Horn, the founder of the company. Um, he started his company as a dry goods store, originally on Market Street in 1849. He's really considered as one of the earliest ones to adopt the idea of department stores. He, of course, is not the only one in his store. He's, he's actually in a partnership with his brother-in-law, uh, Mr. C.B. Shea, and also one of Mr. Shea's relatives, a guy by the name of A.P. Birchfeld. So, they needed capital, you had to have some partners going. This is really considered one of Pittsburgh's really first department stores. They, they move, um, in 1871, out of Market Street to Penn Avenue for the first time in a place called Liberty Hall, or Library Hall. And then it's not until 1892 that they relocate to that Stanwicks and Penn location. But within that first decade of, of um, the 20th century, that store expands and expands and expands. They build out the, the entire block, they build up, um, so it becomes a pretty massive, massive operation. Now, prior to this time, this time in history there, these department stores also are not just doing retail, they actually are doing a lot of wholesale business too. Horns actually spun off their, their wholesale business into something called the Pittsburgh Dry Goods Company. Now I've seen that one a lot in city directories and in uh, some of the Vanity Press uh, books on biographical sketches of, of leading Pittsburgh people. And never knew that. <laughs> so that's one of the things I learned with, with, with our research for this, for this presentation. Joseph Horn actually didn't survive uh, into the 20th century, but his store and members of his family maintained being um, the, the officers and the presidents of their company. So his son was a pretty famous guy as well in Pittsburgh, a guy by the name of Durbin Horn. Any of you go out on Penn Avenue, um, out just before you get to Wilkinsburg, and you see that beautiful house that is the uh, Reform Presbyterian Seminary, that was Durbin Horn's house that he built. That was called the Gables. Then, if, then Durbin Horn's uh, son also became a president of the company. And so the last Horn to be the president of the Horn's department store actually died in 1948. Innovation. What kind of innovation was going on at Horn's? Well, that was really hard to pin down for me. Um, because almost all the literature that I've been able to find on Horns really talked about it being sort of the really nice store to go to. <laughs> um, so they didn't really talk about sort of any kind of innovative kind of thing. But reading between the lines, I, I found a couple of things that I think were probably very innovative at Horns. In 1916, um, under the leadership of, of, of Durbin Horn, they helped establish an organization called Retail Research Association. They basically started doing research on how retail was happening. Better ways to, to, uh, to uh, create um, marketing, that type of thing. So they were also exchanging information with other department stores. I bet they weren't Pittsburgh department stores. <laughs> Along that same time, they, they also created, were part of an association merchandising corporation, which was a group of 19 
department stores in this region that actually did some cooperative buying together. You know, together we can get a better price on things. So those are probably <coughs> some of the most innovative things that I could find that Horns was doing. Now, I'm sure many of you in the audience have, have been to Horns and shopped at Horns. How many have? Very good. Horns, what, you know, this company, one of the things that that Horns, as well as Kaufman's, that we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, one of the things that they did was, after World War II, what did they do? They thought about expansion. And so, it's actually Horns and Kaufman's that really, by the 1960s, start creating more stores in the suburbs, Monroeville, South Hills, North Hills. So, uh, they really see themselves as part of that Renaissance movement, going to where the people are, uh, where more larger populations are, being convenient to uh, the emerging communities out in, uh, in the suburbs. What's another thing about Horns that some of you, I think, will know? Who worked, who worked there as a temporary job? Andy Warhol. Yeah, 1947, Andy Warhol had a summer job. And what, what did Andy Warhol do? He actually was one of the window dressers. He helped decorate the windows. His boss was with Bob Hankley, who just died three years ago. He's 92 years old, a good friend of mine. And I asked him, what, what, are, your, what are your memories of Andy Warhol? And he said, uh, he was a real weird kid. And what, do you have any regrets? Yes, I wish I had kept some of those things he threw in the wastebasket. That's <laughs> <laughs> terrific. He doodled all day. Terrific. Terrific. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the name Horns has really disappeared from, from Pittsburgh skyline. Um, 1994 is the last time that that name was on the store. Um, it became part of uh, Federated at that time and was renamed Lazarus. And of course, by 1995, that store at Penn and Stanwix really ceased to be an active uh, retail space. So, our first one was horns. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. One other thing I wanted to tell you, talk about, there's Durbin. This is the sun. And, of course, this picture isn't coming out very well on this, but, you know, one of the things that horns, man, I could find more images of horns with water around it. <laughs> this is an image uh, that you see the corner of horns at Penn and Sandwich, full of water from the 1907 flood. But, you know, it's an iconic picture. I, I tell you, in most of the searching that I've done for images, I find more images of the floods <laughs> and horns that I, horns that I do, the regular, the, just the regular building. Perhaps we have an obsession with floods. I don't know. <laughs> Here's our next, our next folks. Our next big one, of course, is, is Kaufman's. Now, <clears throat> still in that location downtown, uh, but they haven't always been there. Actually, many of you may not realize, but it was four brothers that actually were part of Kaufman's. There were four siblings. All of them were German immigrants. Um, the initial brother to come from Germany to Pittsburgh was Jacob Kaufman, and he was a tailor. And he set up shop initially on the south side as basically a tailor shop, and then it developed more into a men's and boys store. His second brother to come over uh, was Isaac, and Isaac went into business with him. In fact, for many years, uh, it was called J. Kaufman and Brother, and then it became Brothers. Um, their two younger brothers came to the United States in the 1870s, uh, Morris Kaufman and Henry Kaufman. Now, I think I bet there are people in the room that probably are more familiar with the name of Morris and Henry because, well, I think we have more institutions that have names uh, that are associated with them. So they're probably a little bit more remembered than Jacob and Isaac. It doesn't take too long before they decide, I bet that the shop is a little too big for four people to be working in, because they were fairly small storefronts. They eventually, uh, in the 1870s, after, after Morris and Henry came, opened a second store. 
on Federal Street in Allegheny. Now, you will see, because I'm a member, a board member of the Allegheny City Society, you're going to see me talk about things on the north side once in a while. I'm, it's going to get weaved in here. Um, but, uh, so, Morris and Henry, I assume, are probably the ones that are opening this the site on Federal Street on the north side. Federal Street is, you know, the 6th Street Bridge, what's it called now? Clemente. That's the Clemente Bridge, right? That Federal Street uh, is the, the north side part of 6th of, uh, Street. Well, it doesn't take long, and they have b bigger ideas. They're like, no, we really need to create a, a much larger store. And that's when they, in the 18, um, in 1878, actually move to Smithfield Street. Now, they don't occupy that entire block that we know <coughs> as, as the Kaufman's building today. They build one store at the corner of Fifth and Smithfield originally. Um, and I think you can kind of get the idea from this particular image, which is a postcard. Um, This, this building is actually their original building uh, in the, from the 1870s. They continue to expand over the next 20 years, really, until uh, they pretty much get that entire block. By 1913, they have the entire block. Now, there's a key person that comes into the picture. Morris has a son, Edgar. And Edgar, Edgar Kaufman, he's the idea guy. And where do you think he might have got some of those ideas? He sure did. You, you hit it on the nail at Marshall Fields. Edgar um, goes to Yale, graduates from Yale, and his first job after he graduates from college is in Chicago at Marshall Fields. Guess what time period that is? That's the same time period that Harry Selfridge is there. It is. It is. So one must think that he must have run into it in that store. I mean, that's a big store, but I think, I'm sure he must have run into it. Um, he, come, he actually then takes sort of a tour of Europe for a while and actually starts um, investigating sort of retail, the retail businesses in, in, in Germany and in Austria. Um, he comes back to Pittsburgh in 19... Uh, 08, and actually sets up a general store in Connellsville. But then, within a few short years, Dad says, you need to come, come back to Pittsburgh and actually be part of our store. He starts out at the Kaufman store as the assistant shipping clerk. So this man, really by the age of 28, becomes the head of the store. But this guy started out at one of the low jobs. I mean, I know he's, he's the owner's son, and yeah, yeah, yeah. but, you know, I got, I, I got the feeling that I want to trust a guy that actually was loading trucks and loading wagons. But he must have seen then sort of what everybody's job was like in that store. By 1916, by 1916, one of the things that I found interesting is Kaufman's employs over 3,000 people in their downtown store. 3,000 people. So that's that's only a few years uh, before Edgar takes over the store. There are three things that Edgar Kaufman um, was uh, is credited with doing with with their their store. One is he saw sort of merchandising um, display as as sort of a you know as a research tool trying always trying to figure out a new way what's going to appeal to more people one of the stories I read and I can't verify this because uh, sometimes they're just stories but is that like Harry Selfridge who lit the his windows at night in London Edgar Kaufman's the one who started lighting the windows at Kaufman's department store <coughs> as well. So displays became very important to him. The other thing that happened in the 1930s, he does a complete redesign of the building. You know, he has that renowned uh, architect Jensen um, work on the on the uh, the building, but he also 
has Gordon Robinson create these amazing murals in the, in the store on the first floor. And for the, one of the first times, what we have going on in Pittsburgh is sort of this introduction of art and sort of the finer things, um, something pleasing to look at in their shopping experience. Then the, then the, third, uh, the third big thing that, that Andrew Kaufman does is he wants to upgrade sort of their merchandise. He wants to find better products. And so that's a key piece for him is to find, upgrade their, what they're offering. Um, so he's clearly got some ideas in mind. Um, they're also, Kaufman's is also one of the early ones to do television advertising in Pittsburgh as well. I wanted to show you two pictures here. These are the two younger of the, of the founding brothers. So we have, um, this is Henry on this side, the round picture, and then that's Morris, Edgar's father, and the other one. Anybody got any memories of Kaufman's they want to share with it? Yes? I remember they, they used to have a bookstore, it was a discounted bookstore. I think the seventh floor is also a full bookstore, but they also had the cafeteria. You could always go back and smell all the mashed potatoes sure. while you're looking through the books. You know, I'm sorry, sorry that this is so hard to see, but this picture right here, um, you just can't see it when it's blown up. This is shows the Smithfield Street side, and this is full of glass cases of books. This is from about uh, 1913. Out on the street? Or? Out on the street. So, you know, once again, I think of that idea of merchandising, putting stuff outside to pull people in. Wow. Yes? Did I hear you say there were 3,000 employees? And yes. when was that? In 1960. Because I have been following the Selfridge story, and it just sort of blew me away when they referred to the fact that they had 8,000 employees. And this is at the opening of World War I. That's right. And so that number is... Oh, that would be pretty realistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes? I just wanted to ask, um, in reading about falling water, uh, they talk about the Kaufman, I don't know which one, that escaped the Nazis or left when Hitler came to power in the 30s, and either started or apparently it was already here, which I did not know, because I'm not from Pittsburgh, but uh, so, who was that, and how well, was that person? Well, the three, the four brothers right. had several sisters, several siblings still in Germany. I don't know when the siblings, uh, their lifespan, but it, it certainly there would have been relatives still in Germany at that at the rise of Hitler. Because um, there, they were four children of a family of, I think, about nine or ten. Yes. David, not a direct memory, but uh, Kaufman used Frank Lloyd Wright for falling water, but also to design a Kaufman office at the department store for him. Years later, I was at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, Which is and he had bought that office as an example of Frank Lloyd Wright's design. I don't know if it's still there, but this was 10 years ago, and it was just sitting there, Kaufman office, <laughs> sitting on a floor in the V&A. And, and he had another office that was just that was a design that he bought from somebody in the Middle East. You know, so he must have had a lot of fun. and was interested in a lot of things, I think. Okay, now those are the two big guys that I think everybody probably knows at least a little bit about. Now here comes some that probably you might have heard of, but you really don't know much about. Um, first, the first one of these is Boggs and Buell. Boggs and Buell was at Federal Street on the north side. It was um, created by two partners, business partners, a guy by the name of Russell H. Boggs and Henry Buell. They were both from Butler County originally. Um, they went into partnership in 1869, had a small store on this site, and just kept growing. Um, Boggs and Buell. Um, in many of the people that I have talked to over the years with my association with the North Side, they all talk about Boggs and Buell because that was um, on, the, on the, the trolley lines, the car stops were all in front of it, um, 
and a lot of people have a lot of great memories of it. One of the things I also think is, is interesting is there was a park right next to it. That park was part of the, um, uh, the center of Allegheny City when it was still a city. Um, and originally that was just a, you know, a park with a fountain in it. Well, later on, Boggs and Buell provide the money to sort of update the park, and then it becomes called Buell Park. <laughs> so they've got a park right next to them. Um, both are all three of Box and Buell, Horn, and Horns as well. They really, they, they cater to what was called in the 1890s and the early part of the 20th century, the carriage trade. They had entrances where there were butlers, people with white gloves on to, you know, help the ladies in the door and stuff like that. Um, Box and Buell was also one of those stores that um, if you had enough money, they would close the store so you could go shopping by yourself. Is that building still there? That building is not there. This is all where Allegheny Center is today. So, um, and Mr. Mr. Boggs died in 1921, and Mr. Buell died in uh, 27, I think. Yeah, 27. And, and Buell actually then set up the Buell Foundation. And what he did with the foundation, you know, that's philanthropic, but they initially, were also the trustees for the store. Now, if you want to have a story of a declining store, <laughs> let's have a bunch of trustees from a, from a philanthropic kind of organization probably would. Uh, but um, it lasts for several more decades, but not long. By 1947, it's completely, uh, they completely liquidated the store. Is that the same view of the here? It is. Yeah. It is because the foundation created the plan. David, yes. Could you repeat questions when they oh, come up? She asked if that was the same Buell that um, contributed to the planetarium, the Buell Planetarium. Now the Children's Museum. Yes, that was. It was the foundation. That year, that was that forty-seven. What year was that? That's the year that they liquidated the, the store. Okay, I didn't know we get it closed. Yeah, but and it was shortly after that. 1951 and 52 is when they started planning Allegheny Center. So um, it kind of came on the heels of this idea about redevelopment. And so they demolished, that was one of the first things that was ever demolished over there. And probably was one of those things that helped the ball roll kind of thing. So one of the things I want to point out also, you know, today, on the north side of North Avenue, you can stay at the Boggs Mansion. It's a bread and breakfast. So both Boggs and Mule both lived on the north side. So all four of those Kaufman brothers lived around Allegheny Avenue, North Avenue, Fayette Street in Manchester and West, Allegheny West at one time or another. Now Morris and Edgar moved out to the East End eventually. Um, and Joseph Horn lived in Manchester on Fayette Street. All of our big guys here have my, my north side connection. <laughs> <laughs> the next department store I'd like to just mention is McCurry and Company. Now, I don't think any of you could re remember McCurry's because none of you could have ever been alive at that time. <laughs> but, but you will be familiar with that building. But the McCurry Company, um, had a building which is is faded out here, but that's at the corner of Sixth and Wood. Is that the triangle building? No, it's just a little bit up from that. Sort of. So right behind it is First Presbyterian Church. Okay. Now this building is an interesting building. Now McCurry and Company was not a Pittsburgh company, so I'm sorry, but we're going to eliminate him from our Pittsburgh. Uh, competition of who's, who's Pittsburgh's Mr. Selfridge. McCurry and Company actually was a New York company. Um, founded in New York in the, uh, in the 18, 1860s, uh, but in 1904 they decided that they should open up a branch in Pittsburgh. And they talked to Henry Oliver. Henry Oliver um, owns this land and has this building built. This, I think it's a 13 or 14 story building. Um, hires the architect Burnham from Chicago to design this building. 
one of the neat things I think about this department store is this photograph right here. It's a sepia tone image, brown tone, and you see a bunch of ladies around some tables with a bunch of books. And a branch of the Carnegie Library in it. <laughs> um, but some other things I think that are interesting to point out about. So they leased the building to McCurry. Uh, Oliver leased the building to McCurry. They had a rooftop promenade, which people could go up and actually look at out at the city. Now, it's pretty smoky, I suppose, and some days where it uh, <laughs> wasn't very visible. But um, elevators, they had hydraulic elevators, it says, and they had its own power plant. So these were some interesting innovations that probably are very much um, Burnham and Oliver's sort of uh, contribution. Uh, because McCurry was really uh, just leasing the building, so they didn't build it. But um, in 1908, there was a major study done in Pittsburgh. Ever, anybody hear the Pittsburgh st survey? No. Yes, very good. It was a major study that was done about sort of living conditions, working conditions in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, more than just Pittsburgh, it, inclu it included the entire Mon Valley and stuff like that. One of the things um, in one of the book called uh, Wage Earning Pittsburgh, they, they give accolades to McCurry because one of the things that the McCurry Company did is it, um, is it um, provided chairs and stools for their employees to sit. So if you got tired, your feet are tired, you should go sit down for just a little while. Take a break. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that they commented on was that the store had air scrubbers. So it made for a clean environment, a place where you could breathe easily, and there wasn't a lot of dust around. Interesting idea. Interesting idea. Um, the one thing, though, that I think you really see evidence of about this store is their dining room. Their dining room was an entire floor. And one, if you, uh, any of you postcard collectors here? Yeah? Well, one of the postcards that I've seen a couple of times is pictures of their dining room. Um, it was pretty well known. Uh, many of the women's civic organizations would have their luncheons there. And you see these postcards with, <laughs> uh, with, with uh, comments about, about uh, meeting, meeting at, uh, at McCurry's for lunch. The other thing that was unique about McCurry's is they were the only authorized agent for Stickley Craft. It went, the reason why I said that none of you would have gone to that store is it went out of business in 1930. So it wasn't that that long lived. In its <clears throat> Question here. Question. Yes. <clears throat> Wasn't there some kind of a food poisoning thing or McCreary's in that when they went out of business? I, that's news. I have not found that. So I yeah. remember hearing that. <clears throat> I bet you if we start searching the newspapers, we find something about that. Thank you for that information. He said that he, he remembers uh, talk about a food poisoning incident, which contributed to the closing of that store. <clears throat> Interesting. Well, if they were known for their restaurant, it makes sense, wouldn't it? <laughs> our next tour, our next business that I <clears throat> want to mention is Rosenbaum's. Do anybody know, remember Rosenbaum's? Because that lasted a little bit longer. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> Are you familiar with where Heinz Hall is? It was right across the street from Heinz Hall. Now what's there? A parking garage, right? It was founded by uh, uh, Max Rosenbaum. Here's a great image of, of Max Rosenbaum. Um, and it was founded in, in, during the Civil War. They did not locate to the, to the downtown, lo that location on 6th uh, in Liberty until about 1914. But one of the things that this store was known for was there were 14 passenger elevators for freight elevators. The other thing that I think is interesting about this store is 
The first floor had interpreters for non-English speakers. So you could, if you were, um, spoke German, you spoke uh, probably Slovak or something like that, you could go in and find somebody to communicate with to be able to get your shopping done. 1914 is when this location opened. There was also a post office in this, in this building. They also had their own ice making plant for their coal storage. Now, that makes sense to me because probably people had furs they needed to be stored, so they need, had a cold storage facility. There were also, because people were interested sort of in these new style buildings, these skyscraper-ish buildings, and the kind of mechanics involved with these buildings, they actually gave tours sort of behind the scenes of, of the mechanics of the building. So you could get, you could go in and actually get a tour from a docent. <laughs> Rosenbaum's actually is run by at least three generations of the family, um, maybe, maybe a, uh, probably a few more that were involved. Interesting thing that I found when I was doing the research though, there was a gentleman by the name of Stanley Rosenbaum who died in 2000. He was Max Rosenbaum's grandson, and he was one of the last presidents of this company. And what did Max, what did uh, uh, Stanley do after he closed the company? He went to work for Kaufman's. <laughs> when did it close? 1959. 1959. Now this one I know none of you are going to remember because it has not existed for a very long time. <laughs> but there was a there was a department store called Gusky's, and it was located about where PPG Place is today, um, kind of in that area where the where the rink goes in, the, the plaza there. It was it was created um, by a guy by the name of Jacob Mark Gusky. He was from New York. Question. Yes. Uh, no, just a, a, slight, a little comment. The Gusky family that owned this department store gave the funds for an orphanage up on the north side I'm going to show you a by Riverview yeah. Park, yeah. where the Byzantine Seminary That's right. sits. It was called the Gusky's Orphanage. Right. I've got a postcard on that next, so. Very good. I'm glad. See? See? I know. Yeah. You guys know a lot of stuff. It's My good. dad and Ian's from Very good. And my dad. Well, Mr. Gusky actually, his his father died when he was quite young, and he, and he lived in New York City. And um, his mother remarried, and his stepfather was a guy by by the name of Mr. Cohen. And Mr. Cohen was a tailor. And Mr. Mr. Gusky actually. Um, traveled to Pittsburgh one time. He was a young man at this point. And um, he said to his stepfather, you know, we really need to come to Pittsburgh. We need to open up a, a shop here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Mr. Gusky came here to work for another gentleman for a short period of time. So Mr. Mr. Cohen said, that sounds great. I'll buy, I'll buy that guy out. You can, have the, you can run the store in Pittsburgh. So that's what they did. He started out really as in a tailor shop, created basically a store for men's furnishings, boys' furnishings, and, ch and children's furnishings. Um, this is an ad from about um, 1890, about 1890. It shows kind of a large building, but it was only a three-story building. Um, but one of the things that I think is unique about this one, and Mr. Gusky was very successful. But he actually died at the age of 40, very young, very young. And um, he had bought, he bought his, his stepfather's interest out in the store, so he could and called it uh, Gusby's then. But one of the things that he is so known for, and actually his, his widow, Esther, I think it's Esther, um, was known for was he was very kind to children. And one of the things that he did, he also sold toys, and on Christmas, he always had toys wrapped for any 
child that lived in an orphanage in Pittsburgh or Allegheny. <coughs> About 10 years after he died, his wife, his wife's brother, actually, his wife's brother, Levi D. Wolf, came to Pittsburgh after Mr. Gusky died to, run the to help run the company. They continued to do Mr. Mr. Gusky's philanthropy. And in fact, Mr. Gusky was known as the philanthropic merchant. That's one of the things that was in one of the books from less than 10 years after he died, one of the biographical sections of it. Um, and in 1898, they, on Christmas Day, loaded 26 wagon loads of toys and distributed them on Christmas Day to children in the orphanages and in the hospital. This was a this was a major thing that he was known that that store was known for. They also provided turkeys for the poor during Thanksgiving. Um, but of course, like you said, his wife, to honor his memory, created the Gusky Orphanage. And here is a postcard of the Gusky Orphanage. Now. Um, how many of you have ever gone over to Riverview Park? Okay. Perrysville Avenue, and then you have to turn onto Riverview Avenue. That's at the corner there. So that's my neighborhood. I actually live just a few, uh, just a uh, few blocks from there. And um, so this, the, the one house was built by Mrs. Gusky as the orphanage. Um, the idea was to have a, a, a home environment for um, around 50 children. Um, several years later, they built another house, actually a lady by the name of Bertha Rao and um, Mrs. Cohen, um, Mrs. Josiah Cohen, actually raised the funds to have an additional home built for, their, for the expanding uh, number of children that they were taking care of. Um, but unfortunately, the Gusky store did not last a whole lot longer. Um, by 1904, they really kind of disappeared. They sell out, and they become, remember in 1910, we saw that listing for the new Boston store? Mm -hmm. That's what uh, Gusky's interest sold out to this new Boston store. Okay. What happened Well, the orphanage still existed up until the, the 1940s, right? Yes. Just, just around yes. World War II. Um, now the site is the Byzantine uh, seminary. seminary. One of the things is, is if you go around to the back side of the Byzantine Seminary, I'm told, although I haven't done it because I'm not, I don't go trespassing too much, um, is that you can actually see the remnants of these how the, the back sides of these houses. Today they sort of built um, a, a facade in onto mm -hmm. the front, so it looks like it's a real modern building, probably a 1950s building. Mm -hmm. But I'm told if you look at the back that. This, these houses still are there. Um, what did it? What did uh, it became part of the sub children's fund? The Marsha, do you remember Jewish Family and Children's Service? Yeah, I think that that's who took it. Took over the the funds for it, and and the care was the Jewish Family and Children's, children's fund. Services. Yeah. Okay. So we've just covered just about six departments. So we've certainly missed a few, particularly ones that probably some of you would are familiar with. Gimbals, Mansons, uh, Frank and Cedar. We're not going to talk about them. Sorry about that. Maybe you guys could share some at, 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 as we uh, wrap up a little bit later. But I want to know from the little bit of information I've been able to share with you. So who's your pick? Who is Pittsburgh's Mr. Self? Yeah. <laughs> Edgar Kaufman. Yeah. Edgar Kaufman. Yeah. Any, any dissenters with this? Come on. Well, personally, you're probably right. My, my pick is Mr. Gusky. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody that's going to give give uh, toys to children, I think that this is really cool. And I and Mrs. Gusky as well. I mean, I, I really, you know, she had a lot of foresight in, in creating sort of an institution and providing such great service, uh, a, a very needed social service. So Gusky's mine. But yes, yes, I think I think you're right. In terms of innovation, what was going on? Um, I think Edgar Kaufman sort of really gets it. So, did any did any other stores have uh, like? 
Camp Horn Road. Camp Horn Road has that camp. Yes. Well, Coffins. 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 That was one of the older coffins. It was either Jacob or it was Isaac. Yes. And the reason why, um, I'm sorry, you said the coffin settlement house. In the hill. Irene, Irene. Irene Coffin. I'm sorry, I had that one wrong. Because I was, there was, um, that was actually Isaac. No, it was Henry. It was Henry. Henry was the one that did that with his wife. The one that you're probably missing, though, that was an important institution, though, was the Emma Coffin Clinic, which was in Polish Hill. You know, in Polish Hill, originally West Penn Hospital was really in that area. And when they built the hospital there, Mr. Kaufman, um, which Mr. Kaufman again is uh, Isaac built a memorial to his wife, Emma, and that was the Emma Kaufman Clinic. And so it was to be a place where, where uh, less fortunate folks could actually get some medical care, and it was connected to, to the hospital. Why does it exist today? Uh, the bu it's, it exists today. The building, the building does. It's still there, and you can see the facade with the name around the top, and it's half a block down right. from the church. It's That's right, at, it's that building right on the right. corner, and right. you can see it at the facade. But what happened that, that made that the institution go away? What it was is that was where the medical school was, that the Western <coughs> Pennsylvania Medical School. But shortly after that was done, that became merged into Pitt and became Pitt's Medical School, and they moved to Oakland. Uh, yes. yes. There's an Emma Coffin camp. There was an Emma Coffin camp. Right. There's now the JCC camp. Right. Also at Monitor Hospital, there was the Lillian Coffin School of Nursing. Mm -hmm. And you still see that inscribed on the building on, on uh, Fifth Avenue. Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. I hope this was good for you. I hope you enjoyed it. You guys like history, and if you're ever interested in doing historical research, you know, come on out to see us. Um, you can look online, the Archive Service Center. You can look online, you can sort of see some of the collections that we have. We're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 4.45. Um, we're there for you to help you do research on whatever you're, you're interested in. Now, the last piece that I want to say, I really encourage you to, to look at the Historic Pittsburgh site. Why do I encourage you to do that? Well, one, it's part of my job. <laughs> but secondly, 90% of the images, of the text that I found to sort of do this research was found on Historic Pittsburgh. 90% of the content that I presented here tonight was found there. Now, I knew not, hardly anything about any department stores. Um, and I just went there. Now, you're not going to find everything. But, it's a great resource. It's a, it's a robust resource. You can find a lot about many aspects of our history and our community history. So that's why I really encourage you to look at Historic Pittsburgh. Um, you know, it doesn't have everything, but it certainly has a lot. And I'm sure that it will spark some of your interest. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming. Please take uh, membership forms if you haven't uh, joined us yet. You know, David talks about being a resource. We just had a commissioned lecture tonight for no fee. We, our some of our members wanted a lecture on department stores. This is not something from, that David had in his head. This was written for us. And we doubly thank him for what he did.
please, please join me in historical society co-op and putting chairs away. Thanks. Thank you.